Awesome. So, okay. Hello. I will go back to this one. There we go. Hello. I am Dr. Leah Leach. I am the headmistress of the Uhura Training Academy and the founder of Gals Guide. Uh, I am giving my leg one more day to rest up before getting back into the library. So until then, I am working from home. Luckily, there are slides today, so you're going to see me in a little screen, not so much big screen. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about the gal who Louis B. Mayer promoted as the most beautiful beautiful woman in the world. She was the physical inspiration for Snow White and for Catwoman in the original comics. She was branded as exotic, as luxurious, with a resting bitch face or a resting doe face, like the face of Ned Lights, uh, and she just dripped with sex appeal. But as you will see, um, that it was an image that was constructed for her and it became a prison that she tried to survive. In the 1940s, she had the most recognizable face, yet she was never seen for who she really was. Today, we're going to get to know Hedy Lamar. This is Hedy Lamar. Uh, she is an inventor and a problem solver. At the height of her fame, she filed a that is the blueprint for a technology that we all use today. It's called frequency hopping, and it's used in cell phones, it's used in Bluetooth, it's used in GPS, it's used in Wi-Fi. It's a technology that is estimated worth of $30 billion, yet she never saw a dime. Her story challenges our perceptions of beauty and brains. So let's start at the beginning. Uh, she was born in Vienna in 1914. She was born Hedwig Keisler. Uh, she was the only child to two Jewish parents. Her father was a successful bank director and her mother was a pianist. Uh, her parents were wealthy and cultured, and they encouraged Hetty to think about how things work. At age five, she took apart her music box and put it back together again. Um, I don't know about you, uh, but a lot of people, when you enter your teens and tweens, there's a whole bunch of awkwardness. This is what she looked like in her teens, okay? No awkwardness, girl was gorgeous. Uh, in her teen years, when she entered a room, all eyes were on her. She was asked to sit for photographs. She was asked to be in theater productions. She was asked to be in film productions. Still as a teenager, she starred in various films, including a notorious and racy film called Ecstasy. It is what you think it is. Uh, she's completely nude in the film. She's under the age of 18. Um, in this film, it was denounced by the Pope. The Pope tried to get this film, like, banned. Uh, but it also captured the attention of Frederick Mandel. Of course it did. Uh, Frederick Mandel was a very rich and powerful Austrian military arms merchant um, and munitions manufacturer. Now, he was the Henry Ford of Austria, when it hit, who became very aligned with the Nazis in the 30s. That's right. So Hetty and Frederick were married. They were married the same year as her 1933 breakout role in Ecstasy. Chances they were married because they thought it would take the heat off the scandal of her breakout film. Uh, also, he was rich. His father was Jewish. It was a good match on paper. Uh, he also tried to buy every copy of the film Ecstasy and destroy them. But the film company kept making more copies, so he would keep buying them. <laughs> so he kept losing lots and lots of money. Eventually, he gave up on trying to buy every single one of the copies. Um, Hetty was treated very much like arm candy by Frederick. Uh, she was forced to leave film and just look pretty at dinner parties. Uh, they would even have Mussolini in attendance. 
at some of those meetings, she would listen to them talk about military technology. Uh, but Frederick was paranoid that Hetty was going to cheat on him. So he told the maids to listen to all of Hetty's phone calls um, and her 25 room estate very quickly became a prison. Quite possibly because of the death of her father, that was the tipping point for Hetty to flee her controlling husband and Nazi sympathizing husband. Uh, there are various stories on how she escaped. Um, some of them are, of course, more scandalous than others. Um, but it might have been as simply as just walking out the front door. It might have been. Um, her son tells the story that Hetty hired a maid that looked a lot like her. And then after a dinner party, she drugged the maid with a sleeping pill put on the maid's uniform, and then slipped into the night. That's the, the story her son tells. Um, in 1937, she made it to London, where Agent Bob Ritchie uh, got her meeting with Louis B. Mayer. Uh, Louis B. Mayer was the head of MGM Studios. He was scouting for new talent in Europe. Um, I have gone on rants before about Louis B. Mayer, don't like him. Um, I've gone in rants about podcasts and probably in person because I think I like going on rants about Louis B. Mayer. I'm not a fan, let me just put it that way, of Louis B. Mayer, I'm not. Uh, I will spare you, but in the context of Hedy Lamar, it's important to know that Louis B. Mayer um, was extremely powerful. He created movie stars, he loved glamorous people, and he absolutely hated scandal, okay? Um, also, he was in Europe trying to get cheap talent that was trying to flee the area and basically kind of an indentured servitude-like thing. Um, it was a legal form of it, and it was horrible, and he was very upfront of what he was doing. Um, he offered Hetty $125 a week. He reminded her that she needed to keep her clothes on, and she walked out. She said no. Uh, nice, right? Well, Louis Mayer was the head of the very biggest uh, film studio, MGM, and like it or not, he was her ticket out uh, of the country to the American film business. So Hetty learned what ship he was sailing back to America on, and she booked passage. Uh, one night, she totally uh, decked herself out in her best dress, a few jewels that she was able to like smuggle out of the house, uh, and she strutted into that ballroom and walked past Louis B. Mayer, and every eye in the place was on her. She was hired then for $500 a week, for a contract on MGM. Now there was conditions to her contract. She needed to learn English better. Uh, her look would be overhauled and screen tested and she needed to change her name. Uh, Hetty's look was very similar to, and I'll show you a picture of her, Barbara Lamar. That was the look they were kind of going for, and it's the look she kind of ended up embodying in the 40s. So uh, Barbara Lamar was an MGM actress back in the day. Uh, however, Barbara was most famous for ODing in Hollywood, uh, but it actually wasn't true. Uh, neither was the studio's press release saying that she died of vigorous dieting. That's what the statement released it as. The truth was Barbara Lamar had tuberculosis and died in 1926. Not so ironically, Barbara Lamar was named the girl who was too beautiful. So this is a little fortuitous. The name change for Hetty was decided then and there uh, on the boat. When the boat docked, uh, Mayer announced that he had found, quote, the most beautiful woman in the world. So Hetty's first film uh, was Algiers, sorry, first Hollywood film, it's different. Uh, first Hollywood film was Algiers. She had a very small but crucial role, it was a breakout. Other stars like Vivian Lee started dressing like Hetty. Hetty was in 26 more films, including Boomtown with Spencer Tracy and Clark Gable in White Cargo with Walter Pidgeon. So even though the pictures like gave her her stardom, she didn't pay much mind to it. She knew it was something that would pay the bills. But this is actually what she said. Any girl can be glamorous. All you have to do is stand there and look stupid. 
So she didn't really value the idea of looking glamorous. She also was not getting the scripts uh, beyond a certain type of brainless vixen. That was pretty much what she was getting. Um, maybe that's why she married a screenwriter. Uh, she married George Markey. Um, and that's probably part of her problem solving brain is let me marry a screenwriter and the screenwriter will see me for something more than I am and write better parts for her. But unfortunately, George Markey liked to date a lot of other women and promised them the exact same thing. I will write scripts for you, but the marriage fell apart. Uh, so, Hetty did find a kinship with inventor Howard Hughes. Howard Hughes would actually set her up a lab. This is a, a lab on set that he set up for her. And she would invent things at her home and on her movie trailer. Um, she did say that Howard Hughes was the worst love she ever had. Uh, but Howard relied on Hetty a lot. When Howard was trying to build the fastest plane for the military, it was Hetty who decided to study the fastest birds and the fastest fish and came back to Howard with a new wing design that made him understand the difference of the aerodynamics. Hetty called Howard Hughes um, very strange, very brilliant, and very misunderstood as well. I think that's a fair assessment. So America had not yet entered World War II. However, Hetty was growing more concerned for her mother. Uh, her mother had fled Austria and made it to London. However, the papers were starting to report the German U-boats were torpedoing refugees that were in the boats. One report was the death of 83 children at the hands of German torpedoes. The British were being outmaneuvered. They were struggling to get the upper hand. Uh, it was seeming more and more possible that the Nazis might actually win the war. So Hetty wrote a letter and in it she said, quote, I tried to think of some way to easily divide the balance for the British, a radio controlled torpedo I thought would do it. So radio frequencies are not secure, all right? They can be jammed. Um, so she was thinking, what if there was a secret way to communicate using radio frequencies? Now, there's a wonderful documentary called Bombshell. It is on Netflix right now. I highly recommend it. It's Bombshell, the true story of Hedy Lamar. Um, it has a lovely theory on how Hedy might have got the seed of this idea. And it all comes down to this remote control that was made by Philco. Philco called this a mystery box, okay? And this is actually what it looked like. So this wireless device, it has no wires to it. You dial in like a rotary telephone, what tele, or what radio station, I almost said television station, what radio station you want to change the radio to, and it changes the channel. Now, the reason for this theory is number one, it's in her journal. So, I mean, that's pretty good, right? Uh, number two, it allows for the frequency to change to another frequency without wires. So this was the idea that she wanted, but she wasn't sure how to implement it. She's like something like this for being able to change frequencies for torpedoes. Um, at a dinner party in Hollywood, she met George Antile. Now, George was an avant-garde composer. Uh, their conversation wasn't the boring Hollywood scene. Instead, they were focused on inventions and how to help the war effort. She talked about her torpedo guidance system. Now, it might seem very weird that a piano composer teams up with a Hollywood actress, but what they came up with was absolutely amazing. So George was famous for his performance where he synced together 16 player pianos and to compose a very weird piece of music. It's very jarring to listen to, but there are 16 different player pianos all synced up together. They made a great pair because they had really strong intentions. Hetty wanted to help the war, and get her mother home safely. George already lost a brother to the war effort and he really wanted Hitler dead. Like he was very open about it. So the two of them got to work. 
They wanted to create a secret communication system that couldn't be jammed by the enemy. Wireless changing of a frequency was part of the big puzzle. The other part was the player piano. So here, if you haven't seen, or if it's been a while, what a player piano looks like. Um, you get a roll of paper that has holes in it, and you put it into, dun, 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 dun. hold on, I'm going to go back, and there we go. Ah, ah. Um, back slide. Oh, God, there we go, there's the player piano. Um, so there's spools of paper with holes in them, and those holes line up with the 88 keys of the piano. When air passes through those holes, a hammer is activated to then bang on the string, activating that certain note that is assigned to the hole. So normally when you play a non digital piano, you press a key, right? And that key releases the hammer and it bangs on the string to play the note that you want. The depth of the hole, so those really, really long ones, is how long that note is being played. So the player piano reels are amazing because they can actually play everything um, from Bohemian Rhapsody to Mozart. Um, if you've watched Westworld, you'll see the player piano used a lot. They're even playing like Nine Inch Nails on a player piano. So it's, they are absolutely fascinating. Um, this idea that you could have two player piano reel, reels and they start at the same time and they play at the same speed could communicate in sync and it could hop around 88 different frequencies because you've got 88 different keys you could have 88 different frequencies and it could switch in a split second so hetty and george went to the inventors council in washington dc to show the military what they had and the council agreed that it was a brilliant idea and agreed to help and agreed to fund it they connected them with a physicist and electronic expert okay uh, so in 1942, this is actually their patent. It's Marky because she was still kind of married, kind of married to the screenwriter at the time. <laughs> Wasn't going all that well with the screenwriter. Um, but what they had designed was a transmitter and a receiver, and it would scatter radio signals in a spec in a spread spectrum. The idea is that only the transmitter and the receiver would communicate, and therefore that would allow it to be a secret communication. If you didn't have one or the other, you wouldn't know where the signal was going to hop to. It's the same technology that allows anything without wires. Uh, that's why your cell phone conversation is only heard by the person that you contact. Yesterday, uh, during the questions, we were talking about party lines. So party lines is very much getting on the wire um, and hearing multiple people. Using this technology is why we don't have a party line where we are just connected to one frequency. Um, in 1941, as they were working on this, they filed the patent. It was accepted in 1942. Um, uh, so reading directly from the patent, it says, quote, this invention relates broadly to secret communication systems involving the use of carrier waves and the remote control of dirigible craft like torpedoes. An object of this invention is to provide a method of secret communication, which is relatively simple and reliable in operation, but at the same time, difficult to discover and decipher. So that is what their invention was. This invention was way ahead of its time. It really was. Um, to be sure, so much, when Hetty gave the rights of the patent to the Navy, she gave it to them, they didn't understand it. It was that ahead of its time. They could only picture this. They could only picture, let me see, oh, there we go, a player piano strapped to a torpedo. That's what they thought that they were trying to basically sell them and what they wanted them to manufacture was this physical thing of a player piano strapped to a torpedo. And they're like, we can't do that. 
So the Navy slapped a big old top secret on it and they put it into a drawer. Uh, they told Hetty that her time would be better spent on selling war bonds and raising money for the war instead of the silly inventing. That's what the Navy told her. So she listened to them and that's what she did. Uh, she went on tour dancing, signing autographs, selling kisses for war bonds, and raising lots and lots of money. Reports are that she was responsible for selling $25 million in war bonds. And if you calculate that to today's terms, that would be $343 million she raised for the war effort. It's important to point out, she wasn't even an American citizen. She was working here, she was living here, but she was not an American citizen. It was the fact that the American military knew that. They seized her patents and they said it was property of an enemy alien. Yeah. In a later interview, Hedy asked this very dynamic question. I'm not an alien if I sell war bonds, but if I invent something, I am an alien? Right. Uh, most of Hollywood did not know about Hetty's invention. They did not know because it was top secret. She wasn't allowed to talk about it. Plus, I mean, like, having it being seized as an enemy alien doesn't really make you want to talk about it at parties either. Um, Hetty's beauty was a double-edged sword. She was so pretty that people couldn't see her as smart. And I sometimes say so pretty. She was labeled as being so pretty that people couldn't see her as smart. The inventor and engineer of some kind was like, wait, that didn't fit a stereotype. You know what I mean? It's like, oh, but you're pretty. And the roles that you play in film are the dumb, you know, vindictive airhead, right? Uh, so even in researching her story, I will come across very common headlines and they say, beauty and brains, bombshell with a brain, it's very rare that people think that these two things can actually coexist together. But her invention was actually used in her lifetime. In fact, it was used during the life of the patent. But she and George were never paid anything for decades, which is fine because they actually didn't want to be paid. They wanted it to be used. They wanted it to help the war effort. But that also means they didn't get credit. Credit would have been nice. But in 1952, while the patent was still in its life, the sauna buoy was created using the frequency hopping. Um, but by 1962, during the Cuban Missile Crisis, it would actually be the frequency hopping of their invention that was available on the Navy ships that really made a difference during that time. Then came 1990. So Fleming Weeks was working on a story for Forbes, all right? And he heard a rumor that Hedy Lamarr was an inventor. And so he interviewed her. So in the documentary Bombshell, you can actually hear Hedy's voice uh, in these tapes, these cassette tapes that Fleming recorded. And it's just, it's lovely to hear her voice talk about this time. She was 76 years old when Fleming called her and asked her about her invention. Um, and that would be when the world would finally know that Hedy Lamar was more than just a pretty face. Um, electronic magazines, like Wired, were the first ones to pick up uh, her story. And later, the awards came. In 1997, Hedy was awarded the Electronic Frontier Foundation Pioneer Award and the Gas Spirit Achievement Bronze Award. I'm told it's like the Oscars for inventing. Then again, every award has, it's like the Oscars for insert career here, but <laughs> this one is like the Oscars for inventing. This award is given to individuals who creative lifetime achievements in the arts and sciences, business and innovation have significantly contributed to society. She didn't show up for any of these awards. She was still alive, but she didn't show up. She felt that her beauty had faded and she was living alone as a recluse. So what sent her away? 
uh, what happened between her patents in 1941 and the 1990s. Well, being dismissed by the military that you're just a pretty face that sells war bonds and then being kind of trapped in a film contract with very few scripts coming her way, she was growing very frustrated and then she was labeled as difficult. Difficult. She was sick of the vixen roles, so she started producing her own movies. Uh, in 46, she produced Strange Woman. In 47, she produced The Dishonored Lady. Uh, she sought out and worked with another powerhouse of very early Hollywood, Cecil B. DeMille. Hetty was cast in Samson and Delilah. This was a huge hit for her. A lot of people mostly know her actually from Samson and Delilah. Uh, she actually went on to produce uh, uh, DeMille-ish like films. Uh, she produced The Loves of Three Queens, where she played all three queens, and the story not so ironically, is how beauty got in the way of love for the greatest women of history. There is so much irony there. There really is. Because no matter what Hetty did, the press loved to report anything that was a love scandal about her. Who is she in love with now? Who is she in a feud with now? Any of that kind of type of thing. Um, not always was any of it actually true, but the true part was Hetty sold magazines. She sold a lot of magazines. When it came to relationships, two years after fleeing her first Nazi sympathizing husband, she married George Markey, the screenwriter. Uh, she was 24, he was 44. Um, a few months later, they adopted a child and nicknamed him Jimmy. Um, but remember, he had a thing for other actresses. Uh, John Loder would, and Hetty would marry four years later, and they would have two kids, Anthony and Denise. John was described as a dull British man, and the relationship just kind of didn't work out. Um, Hetty was married to Teddy Stoffer uh, for a year. He was from Switzerland. He was very popular in Germany, known as the Swing King of the 30s, so musician. Um, Hetty's big DeMille film about how beauty gets in the way of love, uh, you can probably see its roots in this film uh, of where it kind of stems from. But this, the, the film struggled to find distribution and Hetty actually lost all of her money making her love of three queens. So she married a Texas oil tycoon. Uh, her marriage to W. Howard Lee would last seven years which was her longest. Um, however, it was a very dark divorce that left Hetty once again with nothing. So by 1965, she had been divorced six times and she remained single for the rest of her life. Uh, in the later years, she would spend a lot of time suing people. Uh, it was something that uh, the men in her life would actually, uh, were showing her how to do this. They were using it against her. Louis B. Mayer sued her when she wouldn't take films that she was under contract for. So kind of showed her the, the importance of suing somebody to get what you want. In 1966, a book appeared as a autobiography and it was called Ecstasy and Me. It was released. Hetty sued the publisher, insisting that the ghostwriter was completely fabricating her story. The book was once again used as branding an exotic woman with luxurious taste, and everything was about who she was sleeping with and who she wanted to sleep with. It was not about her. So if you ever see the book Ecstasy and Me, it was not written by her. She sued them. She tried to get that removed. It didn't work all that well. Uh, yeah. In 1974, she sued Warner Brothers, specifically Mel Brooks, for the use of the Hedley Lamar character in Blazing Saddles. Mel Brooks said this. He said, quote, she never got the joke. Uh, they settled out of court. Mel Brooks had and still has a mad crush on Hedy Lamar. Uh, from the moment he saw her in Algiers, he was in love with her, he wanted to marry her, he was obsessed with her, and so it was a joke, but it was also a reference to he just absolutely adored her, um, but unfortunately she did not think it was funny. In 1997, she tried to sue Coral Draw 
for when the boxes they had had an image of her. Uh, the image was a contest winner, and Coral said that, that she had no rights to the image, and they said a lot of courts as well. Um, another factor in a lot of this recluseness and also a lot of this suing was pills. Pills, pills, pills. Hetty was a patient of Dr. Feelgood. Dr. Feelgood was Max Jacobson. Um, she was not Dr. Feelgood's only patient. If you don't know, John F. Kennedy, Bogart and Bacall, uh, Judy Garland, Elvis Presley, Marilyn Monroe. I mean, I could do a whole thing on who were Dr. Feelgood patients. Um, Dr. Feelgood was called to film sets to give actors vitamins. Um, Judy Garland was on vitamins a lot during The Wizard of Oz. It was really amphetamines is what it was, uh, and they're highly addictive. Um, it causes wild mood swings, hyperactivity, and impaired judgment. So it's quite a possibility that that's part of the factor. Um, it's most likely the reason why she was arrested for shoplifting in 1966, even though she had $1,000 in cash on her at the time. Uh, she became the butt of many jokes around this time, uh, Warhol, Andy Warhol, actually made a whole film mocking her. On tour, Lucille Ball uh, did a white cargo spoof of Hedy Lamarr's character. Hedy didn't have it easy. She had jokes from many different sides. Um, so what happens when you're first noticed by society because of your beauty? What happens when you're first introduced to the world as the most beautiful woman in the world? What happens when you're not 20 anymore? And what happens when you grow old? Uh, it seems that Hollywood, her husbands and reporters didn't want Hetty to get older and they were brutal to her. The papers would read, you were so beautiful, she's so ugly, and you wouldn't recognize her. This is what headlines and what stories were saying about Hetty Lamar. This is Hedy Lamar in 1969 when she is 55 years old. And this is kind of the surge of the, you were so beautiful, she's so ugly, you wouldn't recognize her. I don't get it. I think she's drop dead gorgeous. I don't, it's weird, society's weird. So Hetty also had a lot of plastic surgery. She was actually revolutionary in plastic surgery as well. She knew where the incision should be to lift an area to stay useful and where to hide the incision so that people wouldn't see it. So that worked until it didn't. Uh, she had a series of botched plastic surgeries and then she went into hiding. Uh, it was apparent that the only thing the public wanted was her beauty. And if they couldn't accept her here in 1969 at the age of 55 looking this drop-dead gorgeous, after some botched surgeries, they couldn't. When it was finally recognized uh, that her involvement in the invention of Wi-Fi and CDMA and Bluetooth, uh, be, it would be her Hollywood headshot that they would use on the covers of magazines um, in the news articles. She did not show up to accept any award, um, saying that the people wouldn't accept her because she wasn't as pretty as she once was. She died in 2000, the year 2000, at the age of 86. So that's not that long ago that she died. So here's what's really interesting about Hetty to me, and maybe we can talk on this idea when we open it up for the comments and for discussion. Um, when I first learned about Hetty, I also learned this phrase right at the same time. It was actually when I was researching Hetty, um, I went on vacation and I went to this museum and this guy was obsessed about this phrase called the union of opposites. And it was this combination of things at the time that really, really um, moved me. So here we have this union of opposites, okay? We have a Hollywood star 
and an inventor. They seem like two opposite kind of uh, careers, paths, brain workings, okay? We have frequency hopping and player pianos. Secret communication system and a player piano, opposite sides. Torpedoes and cell phones. The initial use of torpedoes, the eventual use of cell phones. And then of course, beauty and brains. These opposite things, when they blend together, it shows the oneness of things that were conceived to be previously different and that they're not different. And when two opposite things combine, they create something just absolutely magical. So Hetty really taught me to see the world in terms of opposites, but in also in terms of interconnections. And I think that's like a kind of trend, transcendence, basically. There's joy in invention. Um, so, but here's what I want to like leave you with. Um, these are Hetty's words that she left on the answering machine to her kids in her late years. Um, she's reading Kent Key's Paradoxal Commandments, okay? So she didn't write this, but she read it to her kids, and it really kind of sums up her journey and where she was at at the end of her life, okay? And she said, people are unreasonable, illogical, and so obsessive. Love them anyway. If you do good, people will accuse you of selfish, ulterior motives. Do good anyway. The biggest people with the biggest ideas can be shot down by the smallest people with the smallest minds. But think big anyway. When you spend years building, may be destroyed overnight. Build anyway. Give the world the best you've got and you'll be kicked in the teeth, but give the world the best you've got anyway. That's Hetty. So we're gonna open it up for discussions. I'm gonna open it up our glorious screens and stuff. Um, the first question that I have for you, and I'll, any comments that you have, I will gladly take, but do you think that Hetty could have become an inventor if she wasn't a Hollywood star? I will pose that as one of the uh, first questions. 